Hi, I'm Hannes Hirsch. I'm the author and director of Drifter. Uh, Drifter is my debut feature film. Um, uh, it's going to premiere in Berlinale Panorama this year. And it's a second coming out story, a uh, coming of age story, uh, a love story, and my personal love letter to the queer community of Berlin. I'm Lorenz Hochhut and I'm playing the main character Moritz in Drifter. Hi, I'm River Matzke. I'm the co-author and dramaturg of Drifter. Hi, welcome to the 30 TV. My name is Jean Bourbobac, and this time we are talking about the film Drifter. Hi, welcome to the Teddy. Welcome to the Berlinale. Hi. Hi. Thank Hi. you for taking the time uh, to talk about the film. Um, maybe let's just start. What was the starting point for the movie? Yeah, um, I wrote on on the screenplay for many many years. Okay. Um, a lot of the stories that you see now happening in the film, uh, like scenes, like people who are like characters who are appearing, just somehow were, were things that I've seen in the last 15 years in Berlin, experienced myself, like seen on other people, like mm -hmm. heard stories about. And for a long time I was like trying to, to bring these little things together and um, making a storyline out of them and um, creating some meaning or also yeah. finding out what does it mean actually these things that I've seen and these character developments that I've seen mm -hmm. like on myself of course mm -hmm. um, but also on other people and um, yeah I just wanted to tell these stories and and then see what like how it looks like and I made yeah. some sketches um, with with like just friends and trying to to find uh, the essence of mm. all this and I see then, yeah. the film <laughs> follows uh, Mohit uh, who is the main character in the movie how was his character born out of all of this that you have just explained I think at one point Moritz is just a tool to tell <laughs> the people around Moritz yeah um, he's just like a like a little vehicle and we we drive inside of this character through yeah. all these different um, um, locations and all these different worlds but of course it's also about Moritz who is um, like becoming a new person kind of uh, like three times like he's changing like mm -hmm. he, how he looks like he's changing his his attitudes maybe his opinions um, but also he's staying the same and I think in the last image, it could be still like the Moritz from the beginning. This, this was also a very big topic for me, like how does change happen? Is it more mm. on the outside? How much is it on the inside? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and then obviously you just mentioned that Moritz has this interesting journey in the film and there are like a few transformations for him. Um, can we unpack a bit um, this journey and, and maybe the, the psychology behind it. What are these different stations that 
Moritz is going through um, mm -hmm. in the film. Maybe you want something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we kind of carved that out in the screenwriting process step by step. Um, Hannes and me, we met in Athens and then we went to the Thessaloniki Film Festival and Hannes approached me and um, kind of didn't really pitch me the story but we were sitting there in a cafe in the sun yeah. and Hannes told me about the story and he kind of narrated it and then I was like, yeah, I, I really like it and I would like to, um, to keep on developing it together first uh, from the position of a dramaturg because mm -hmm. I liked that it had like a more complex and realistic and also psychological view yeah. um, on what it means to be um, a gay cis man in, in like in the big city nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I found also many traits of uh, topics like uh, hidden trauma, in internalized um, homophobia, uh, what does it mean to live collectively with friends, um, where do we find belonging and so on. And then um, I think it's really like one of my teachers, Petra Lusho, once said to us in a seminar at the DFFB that everyone always wants to write autobiographical because it's supposed to be so easy because you can just narrate what you know. But then after a while you figure out that it's actually extremely hard to do autobiographical writing mm -hmm. because it's so hard to know yourself and to get to know yourself and often it takes a lifetime. Um, so we kind of, I think, I came a bit with an outside view and then we carved out the different um, character aspects of Moritz and then um, step by step also uh, we started creating these, I think it's kind of like three different worlds that are now in the editing very mixed up and intertwined um, and started to discover who Moritz is in each of these worlds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did you approach Lawrence um, bringing this uh, character to life on, on the screen? Um, I think the, the biggest um, question or how to, to play this character because, um, was to me because he's really passive. Mm -hmm. um, they are not, like I, I don't say many words or something. Yeah. It's more that I come into a situation and I'm standing there and watching and introduce myself a lot of times to people. And yeah, that's what actually your, your sentence that you said most often, I'm Moritz. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm Moritz. <laughs> and yeah, we did then um, in the recordings, I did like different types. Hi, I'm, Mor Hi, I'm Moritz, I'm Moritz. Mm -hmm. After the scene <laughs> to have yeah, different versions. And um, that was um, for me uh, one thing I, I haven't played before. <laughs> that yeah. was a little bit tricky but also nice because you have you're just there and you watch the scene and you're part of the scene but like not normally there's a problem and you try to solve this problem and then um yeah that what makes the scene vivid i think <laughs> and this time it was more um yeah i'm, I'm kind of outside and experience everything mm -hmm. I think we were talking a lot about the person before, mm -hmm. also like me about personal experiences mm -hmm. and also about private and intimate stuff, like how we see things, how and stuff. And then I just put you in all these different situations in the shooting. I mean, we just arrived and like, okay, we arrive here in this location. <laughs> this is your actor for today. I mean, you read the script, of course. Yeah. But um, and this is. Also, I think how it works that you really reacted on the on the things that were happening. Like, yeah, and I mean, yeah. also many uh, things I played I haven't done before or something. Yeah. On, and um, that also helped me because I think Moritz also haven't done this stuff before, right. <laughs> and I just yeah. could uh, be there and see everything and um, yeah. And it was a very tough shooting. I mean, we, we, we were shooting like 35 days okay. and Moritz was like in every single shot he was mm. there or Lorenz. Yeah. And it was really a lot of work just like yeah. going through all these different situations. I see. And how did the casting happen? So how did you find the cast? <laughs> uh, let's yeah. talk a bit about that as well. That's a funny story because um, in general, I wanted to say that maybe now it looks like these are all friends from um, the queer party world in Berlin, but mm. many of the actors have not been in a club ever in their life. 
and um, it's really like I was the casting was quite long and very intense also and I casted many many guys for movies and then we <laughs> had this little office in my university and at one point just the door opened and no, I, did, I did to, but yeah I basically run into you I mean I had a performance at the place where Hannes did the casting and I saw that people do something uh, filming some stuff and I was hi what are you doing and Actually, Hannes was really stressed and was like, no, we don't have time, we're doing <laughs> casting, um, go out, see you later, bye. And then I was like, oh, okay, ciao. And afterwards he came to me and said, actually, um, you fit really well <laughs> for my main character. Can I cast you tomorrow? And I was, I was like, um, okay, um, um, yes, but I won't prepare anything. I can come as... As you are. As I am, <laughs> yes, as I are. And, and um, then I had, I, for me, it was the best um, casting experience I ever had because we had, like, Hannes, um, like, we had three hours and we just worked. It wasn't really, like, we, we played a yeah. lot of scenes, a lot of stuff. Yeah, but if you, if you realize as a director, okay, it could work. <laughs> then you mm -hmm. try out many things as much as you can to see, see. also how it, can you work with this with this actor does it like is it yeah like yeah <laughs> yeah but i, I think yeah. i think um castings i mean if you have the time should be more like this mm -hmm. because as an actor you you have normally 10 or 5 minutes and it's really rough and stressy and mm. to be good yeah. in this situation it's almost doesn't work <laughs> so I, I really liked I liked the casting and um, then you said I, I got the role and at this point to be honest I'm I didn't know <laughs> what I I have done there yeah. signing up yeah. yeah I see and the, <laughs> but the best uh, the best things here. come very surprisingly usually um, yeah let's talk a bit about because River very nicely talked about the complexities of, of this particular character and, and the screenwriting process as well. Um, what was your aesthetic approach of translating all of that to the screen? Yeah, um, at first when you hear, okay, it's a Berlin party film mm -hmm. with a lot of club scenes, it's a gay, gay queer movie, maybe you see some very colorful images like that also the camera is like more like a music video, mm. something. But we always try to uh, keep a distance to the whole story and um, look on the things a bit from the outside, um, give space to the individual characters and not only use them as decoration, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but really like give them space. And um, at the same time also celebrating the nightlife and the hedonistic excess moments when you're all dancing under the shower um, mm. and putting this together with the soundtrack. Yeah. Um, yeah, and like, yeah, it's always, the, the whole film is always two sides, I think, in many aspects. And the same is with the camera also, mm. that Eli Bjornike was doing a great job, I think. Mm. Yeah, I really like this about the film, that it's not, the, the visual style is not the cliche visual style that you would think there is if you talk about films like from the party scene or something yeah. like as you said like fast cuts of of close-ups and extremely like artificial images mm. it's more like a really very decent and more more quiet and observant kind of a film so the style is kind of um it's a very loud setting yeah. but the style is kind of quiet mm -hmm. and i really like that this creates kind of a tension and I think also, like for the screenplay, this also allowed us to look a little bit more detailed at um, single scenes. Yeah. It was really nice yeah. to have like in a setting where you would actually say like, yeah, okay, like this is this, yeah, nice, loud techno music and everyone's so free and whatever. But we could like really move a little bit more slowly and really see like, okay, so how is this person feeling? How is this person feeling? what is actually really happening in a very quick pace yeah. in this in this moment um, that like there's the euphoria but then there is also the hurt and then you can show both sides and you don't just run through the club mm -hmm. like I really I like that I think yeah. we created to we, we try to create like a tender view on mm -hmm. everything 
Maybe yeah, that's, a, that's a word I would describe the, yeah. the camera and the, the style. Yeah, mm. you mentioned about the soundtrack. Can can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, it? because yeah. that was also an <coughs> integral. I, element yeah, I realized course. during the whole process. I mean, filmmaking and also it's my first feature film. It's my debut film, mm. so I haven't done this in this scale yeah. ever. Um, so I during the whole filmmaking I was learning many things and at one point I realized ah yeah like making a film about nightlife also is about the music because mm -hmm. music is a very important part of it, so maybe right. a central part of it and I was thinking because we have many many scenes now it's like more or less like 20 24 tracks in the film some are more like prominent like a stripped down Ailey Gregory who made uh, the score or mm. the soundtrack, others are more in the background. And then the idea was to really also um, give a platform to queer artists, mostly from Berlin. Yeah. And so I also I asked Ona Friedrichs, who helped me to do the music selection. And um, we were mostly contacting only queer artists. Mm -hmm. And now I think we have created a very nice soundtrack also for the film. And I say a big thank you to all the artists who supported us with their tracks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Um, how important was it for uh, for you to um, to portray this particular scene authentically in the film? Because obviously there are many different ways how this can be yeah, yeah. approached. Um, so yeah, I was I was wondering about about that. How important was that for for you? Um, of course it's important. I mean, it's not a question to make an authentic film. I think for me it's, mm. it, it's not a, like it's clear that it must be authentic and not a cliche. I don't want to make cliches. Um, but of course, there, like, we had some problems, for example, how do you show somebody taking their first ecstasy pill in the, in the club mm -hmm. or the, the first line? I mean, we have seen these many, many times. And um, if you see it again, like you have already seen it, you cannot really see what's happening so we had for example this idea to put this scene where all these guys around Moritz take the drugs to move them into a private car which yeah. never happens in Berlin because nobody arrives with a private car in a club um, but anyway we did it just to make it fresh and um, yeah and mm -hmm. we we tried to show Berlin of course but mm -hmm. not show the TV tower for example what's also a decision yeah, right. we give this feeling of Berlin but didn't want to make like a typical Berlin movie mm. yeah I think that was pretty challenging and sometimes like to write the scenes in a way that they are not cliche because mm -hmm. it's also it's actions that happen so much you know it's like not even in film it's also in social life like going to a toilet stall together to consume, for example, is in itself such a choreography. Mm -hmm. And then in real life, it doesn't necessarily seem like that. But as soon as you put the camera at it and then you're within a film, then suddenly you have a cliche. Yeah. And you wouldn't recognize it otherwise in real life. And what was important for me with this project was I'm also not a big fan of the word authentic. But I mean, I think we all know that it's kind of we have to use the word. But then again, it's a little bit like overused you know or like what's it yeah. yeah, supposed to be like in in like times of digital stuff and so on but what I liked about the film is that like, especially with contemporary queer series making where lots of narration is happening uh, you always have this feeling of like a high thin reality or an artificial reality mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily has it's not I don't think that it's wrong or I don't think that it's false and I also write this way and I think it can be something like a crystal because you have to narrate for so many people that you you kind of have to like lift everything up and make it a little bit larger than life so that it's approachable from from many for many different viewers but um, for me it was really nice this experience to write this screenplay because it felt like home because mm -hmm. it was not like I was I had to translate my own living environment um, uh, into some kind of form that then is being watched by others yeah. I could just write straight from the heart and like yeah, I remember the summer that I wrote all the dialogues. It was like really hot. It was 38 degrees and I was just lying on my bed in my turn, <laughs> just writing down the dialogues. And it was so easy because it was, I was just like, OK, I'm just going to write, write, write what the people in my life say. So. Yeah, yeah, but nice. it's also a question about like um, the casting and um, like, exactly. mm, like many people know what they are telling, what they are playing in the film. 
also the extras, I think they all supported us during 2020, mm -hmm. uh, 2020 when there was COVID. So yeah. there was no party happening, but still they wanted to show what was important to them. Yeah. And so they really supported us and um, played like nightlife at eight o'clock in the morning sober um, <laughs> for 12 hours. <laughs> yeah. in Everybody was so on fire. Yeah, they were really <laughs> supporting, like also the costume department, like Nina, Edgar yeah. and Janina, they really wanted to um, to show all the pieces that they mm -hmm. brought together. And yeah. yeah. When we take a look in the film to, I would say like a particular and well recognizable facet of the queer community, um, but obviously um, it's like a it, it, it's a fragment of a wider community that uh, we are looking at. Um, so I like just uh, as I was watching, the question kind of came up to me um, that in what way did you think about inclusivity um, regarding this big colorful scene, particularly in Berlin, um, which is like very known for its queer community and, and the vibrant queer life in the city. Um, what was your take on, on, yeah. on this element? Do you want to, should I say something? Yeah. Um, I mean, um, it's a film about a queer family, mm -hmm. uh, the queer family, but also uh, that, that is like seen sometimes from the outside as a very um, nice and colorful group of people that are all nice together with each other with each other um, but this was also one reason why i wanted to make the film because i think many things are not really totally fine within the community and sometimes mm. it's not community but it's more like one against each other mm. and um, i wanted to show this of course and i think there are some some protagonists in the film and um, that are like yeah, depicting this a little bit, but also like giving this possibility, and I think like of the queer f queer community as a as a family for for Moritz, where where he yeah. finds himself, where he can be, but at the same time also in the last image he's alone in his car. So um, yeah, yeah, and also I think like as I see it, it also shifts with Moritz the longer he is in Berlin and how he moves through the different worlds. You know, so we start off and it's very, it kind of starts off like a very traditional uh, a cis gay narrative in the surroundings yeah. and in the topics. And also pretty conventionally masked in the gender roles. And I don't mean the costumes, I also mean the kinds of interactions, mm -hmm. like how um, the characters deal with a breakup, for example. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not deal with a breakup at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then it, it slowly changes during the film and Moritz discovers himself more and has more different um, influences from his surroundings and starts to care for himself and starts to um, question himself, question his decisions, question how he wants to live and um, also step by step is being, I think I wouldn't say Led, but maybe also learns a lot from, in the widest sense, from characters, mm -hmm. especially um, concerning self care and, and like presence in the moment and stuff, which is in contrast to his very, very mass presenting uh, costume in the middle of the film, yeah. which is almost like, I think, like a that's almost like a trope or like a like a very generic thing in itself in Berlin, you know, like yeah. how many people look like this, like even me like seven years ago, I also looked like this and, and that's like not at all who I am. And then, um, yeah, especially with the role of Kazi, who, who touches Moritz in his loneliness and I think Moritz touches Kazi in their loneliness and they have this moment where Kazi mm. says it's really about the trust hard to yeah. find someone that you trust um, yeah so for me it's like it's a part we show a part of Moritz journey in the end of the film Moritz is probably not where he is go would be if this film would continue for six hours right it's a bit like the beginning of a waking up process yeah. 
And also, it's, I think it's a part of the character that is very introvert and very observant when you come to the big city and you have to figure out, ah, okay, this is the structures, this is the people, this is how they move, how they behave, this is the identity that I could be, or is this the identity that I could be? And then you jump through them and then you find yourself in yourself yeah. and you find yourself after the disillusion. Like mm -hmm. while you're in the illusion of the city, you can't really find yourself. And so for me, it would also be interesting to explore if we take this last frame of the film um, and then start narrating from there, what's going to happen then? Because mm -hmm. we already That's said that question, maybe yeah. we want to narrate more about community and stuff. And I think then also that would be the point where, but that's something for Hannes, where the, the, where the stylistic language of the film might also shift because it would, like the emotional and psychological conflicts of the characters, they would be more on the outside and it would really like it maybe be about mm -hmm. more in the scenes and there would be more friction and stuff. Mm -hmm. So from a writer's perspective, I'm already really excited to explore this. <laughs> Yeah, we're, the second we're planning to, to work together. So are, are, are you yeah, foreshadowing yeah. an upcoming yeah. project what here? I, Do I hear this correctly? I wanted to add one little thing. The, the film is sometimes uh, called like a second coming out. Uh -huh. And um, I mean, the film starts where Moritz arrives in Berlin and the coming out maybe was when he was 15 or 16. We don't know. Um, like most people like in Germany, like, uh, just to say as an example, come to Berlin and it's not about, hey, I'm gay. This is not a question. But the question is like this personal development and all the different people in this film are on a different level. They go in different directions of their personal development. Mm. There's like uh, Kasi, who is like a non-binary person. There's Moritz, we don't know where he will end. There's Ron, like the toxic mask, muscle guy. Um, and also, it was important for me to, to not judge, to just let all the people go in their direction and you don't know, like they only know for themselves where their personal truth is. And yeah, I think this is a bit yeah. what the film is about. Like also with Ron, for example, what I like about the character Ron is that Ron in itself is like not toxic at all. Yeah. Ron is actually really nice and really sensitive. Yeah, yeah. But then the toxicity actually is like it takes place within the projections mm -hmm. onto Ron, but Ron, Ron is just in the middle and Ron, I mean, of course, Ron, Ron knows like he's part of this club of the hundred. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 there, yeah, okay. there is, mm -hmm. a, we will there get is. to this. There is a very interesting yeah. scene. Um, mm -hmm. Then maybe let's talk about that scene yeah, yeah. right now. Um, there is this one scene um, there, Moritz has another friend, acquaintance, uh, Stefan, um, and they also have a very interesting dynamic, the two of them, and their journey is in some way running on a parallel course, but to rather yeah. different directions. Um, and there is this particular scene where uh, Ron invites Moritz over, and there is um, Stefan who is exploring uh, his submissive side, um, and um, Moritz, um, yeah, sexually humiliates uh, him in in that scene. And there, Ron plays an important mm -hmm. role. He uses exactly these mm -hmm. qualities that you just mentioned mm -hmm. to kind of convince Moritz, who doesn't want to engage in this act in the beginning. But he's doing it. For him. For him, exactly. Yes. So uh, that yeah. scene is a very interesting and I think a very crucial scene in the mm -hmm. film. Can we unpack that a bit? Can you, can you tell how did you approach that? Obviously, I'm very curious how it was for you as an actor, the experience to, to go to that place. Um, yeah, let's, let's just... Yeah, it's a very complex scene because it. all the different storylines come together. Mm -hmm. um, and you can view on this scene from every character's perspective. Um, I mean, to talk about Stefan, who arrives in Berlin, like mo mostly exactly at the same right. position where also Moritz starts, mm -hmm. just he doesn't have a boyfriend. But um, And then they, all, they both meet in the beginning to play like classical music together. And in the end, they end up like one guy, like, um, like humiliating the other ones actually and getting his uh, yeah, thing out of it. Um, it, but what's really important, I think, is that you see that he wants it. And also later on, um, there's yeah, another yeah. scene where you like c cover this, uh, like uh, I, I, I get released when I see yeah. this mm -hmm. other scene where he actually, we're talking about this moment. Yes. And that, um, yeah, I think that's, that yeah. 
you need something like this if you show something mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, but then I think this raises such essential questions that I also often have in nightlife in Berlin and yeah. also towards BDSM within the queer scene in Berlin, but also in general. So how do you deal with BDSM within a society with toxic structures that educates us in specific ways to have specific kinds of um, self-esteem and trauma that is being reproduced in the sexuality with which we find pleasure. So then, um, you can, of course, it's within what Stefan wants, so it cannot be questioned. And it would be um, like, like, for example, me coming from the outside in the situation, if it would take place in my life, I could not go behind this line of um, Stefan who says, no, I want this. Because that is Stefan's own responsibility. Mm -hmm. And if Stefan is in control of the situation, um, like truly, and you, you can say like that his verbal saying yes to that situation um, is, is a proper yes, then you have to respect it and accept it. I think that's one view. But then coming, um, I know what you mean, like coming from the author's perspective, if you go behind the curtain and if you look at the characters, then of course it's, it's um, social power dynamics that are being reflected. Okay. I mean, it's not a situation that takes place on neutral ground. It's a, like, like if, a, if a very, very, very big and mask um, a heterosexual man dominates a gay uh, a cis man um, whose physique is not built in the way that, it, that it's um, a suitable or very high ranking in the conventional generals of society. Of course, that's a political thing. But this is also, yeah, why, yeah, this scene is just, it's, it's, it's very complex. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and it's a thing, I don't have answers for that. I think nobody really at the moment has, yeah. have, has answers mm -hmm. for this. I think it's, it's a social process that we're all going through mm -hmm. together. Just to, to give a very concrete yeah. example, um, in the very beginning of the film, um, when they come down in the, the U-Bahn, they, before they go to the lake, yeah. um, the character Daniel, played by Aviran Idri, mm -hmm. um, he's telling a story where somebody spit on him, yes. or spat, I don't know exactly, uh, <laughs> when he was a teenager in school. And then in the very end of the film, I mean, or later, just like we, we, we put together like many different characters now, but he's collapsing on GHB. Just to give a little storyline, we don't know, like if I don't would, I wouldn't make a direct connection, but yeah. then in the end, Moritz spits on, on uh, Oscar Hopper, like who plays Stefan Stefan. in the end, and he gets out of this like some sexual uh, pleasure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just to give these links a little bit. I, I think we're also like a little bit in this time in between, I think, like for, for me personally, I would wish also for the, for, the, for the public discourse about like discriminalization and marginalization and, and so on. Um, I think it's important that we become a little bit more emotional and psychological, mm -hmm. that we shift it more towards the inside also and that we really explore what does it do to humans to be othered um, trauma-wise during their entire life. And like, for example, because right now we're talking about the specific case of uh, white cis gay men from yeah. a genderqueer perspective. I think there is not like, there is two publications of two books that we also read, right? It's like the, it's like the, this, the Velvet... The Velvet Rage. The, the Velvet Rage, mm, yeah. and then it's A Straight Jacket by Matthew Todd. They kind of analyze like a like a gay path of life and biography from a like trauma critical or psychological perspective, mm -hmm. but they are not even translated into German language. Like there is like there is not a single uh, publication about this in German language, and I think mm -hmm. that shows just um, how massive the problem is because everyone thinks that now that you're not being, like, like if you're cis, now that you're not being like bothered or like um, killed or attacked on the street, that's the point where everything is fine. But that's not the point where everything is fine. Between being fine and being killed on the street, there's a huge variation yeah. of pain, trauma, suffering, psychological disease, and mm. so on. And this transition zone into happiness from the extreme physical violence into happiness, I think this has to be explored more also in films. 
Mm. There was this article in the Huffington Post from Michael Hobbs. Mm. It's called something like Together Alone. Yeah. And it talks or it says that uh, even nowadays, like in liberal societies um, where there's uh, equal marriage happening, still like it talks only about gay men. So like mostly gay men, they still suffer a lot of anxiety and depression and the suicide rates are much higher. Um, and um, this happens also to like white cis gay men, like so, like Moritz. Yeah. Um, and this was also for me a bit the starting point to make like ah, it's, it's important to make this film somehow, and that's also why I wanted a, a white cis uh, mm. man for this yeah. for this role. Um, yeah. Yeah, I see. And how was it for you to to, to go to that particular scene. place and in that scene? That that's obviously a I mean, was we, a turning yeah, point for Moritz. Yeah, if I mean, we shot the scene really late, um, and yeah. basically almost at the end of yeah, everything. Yeah, that was a, because there was COVID at that time, yes. so mm. we had some shifts in the shooting schedule, and we needed to wait like three or four months to be yeah. able to shoot again. And that was month. like the last, <laughs> last, last part. Mm from everything yeah, yeah. and so we had this little break and when we were seeing each other the vibe was really nice everybody yeah. was hey we're back we're back and then shooting this scene was kind of hard yeah. Yeah. but yeah. also it I think it was good because it's so brutal and um, you have to I don't know you have to play this and then but after the cut everybody was happy again mm. and that really helped me playing this often but when I saw it on the, um, yeah. because when we did the synchronizing, I didn't tell you, <laughs> I supposed to be uh, like just yeah, yeah. watch my scenes that we were synchronizing, and but I skipped and, and I, I saw it and I was really um, afraid and shocked from myself mm. to be honest because yeah. if you did like a really nice job um, on the cutting and the editing. Um, and you don't see the people smiling anymore after the scene and laughing and yeah. stuff and just being rude and mean and rough to each other. I was like, oh, wow, okay, that's also a part of me or it can be a part mm -hmm. of me or a part of Moritz. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, when I was playing it, I didn't f felt that it's so intense, but I, yeah. when I was watching it, um, yeah, I was really... Yeah, it got hit you differently. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. I see. I can, I can, I can imagine that. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, like it came up multiple times now in this conversation already. Um, this question about um, a certain type of performing masculinity and how that has uh, very toxic consequences and very toxic impacts on individuals and communities. Um, I'm really wondering how, what was your thought process behind it and how did you uh, try to kind of portray this on, on screen and how did you navigate uh, working with this, with this theme which really like goes throughout mm -hmm. uh, the film? Do you want to say something? Yes, okay. Hmm. Hmm. How did we navigate this? Um, it's a, it's a I mean, it's like, uh, we worked walk, we worked on the autobiographical story that you mm -hmm. brought into the process, I think, and then many things um, changed within the process, and I think many things also became more explicit, yeah. and the main character also changed a lot. Maybe you want to say something about that? I think it it also um, happened in between us because mm. we have different lives and and. Mm -hmm. um, you look on it and on, from a different perspective than I do, and we were talking a lot about this. And this is also what, yeah. what in the end, I think made the made the story and the character yeah. quite complex mm -hmm. or authentic or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, I think that's it's pretty specifically. I think the level of the film, like aside from the setting and so on, but like the characters in there, in the scene that they are in, um, like. The, like coming from my perspective as a co-author, mm -hmm. um, the scene and the setting are autobiographical. But the characters 
for me, are not really autobiographical. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, of course, because we all have similar um, themes and struggles, it's a very personal and a very intimate film also for me, which I didn't expect so much in the screenwriting process, but I, it actually struck me more when I saw the film in the end that it really moved me and, and, and did something to me. Also mm. the fact that this film is coming out and it's going to Panorama and, and it's quite big and so on. I didn't expect the fact that it w would have such an emotional impact onto me. I thought I would have a little bit more, more distance to the project. Yeah. And I think that um, it is specifically for me the case, I, like I lived as a, a gay cis man for many years of my life and gr I grew up like this. I thought that I grew up like this because it was this very like like, like Christian Eurocentric, also you can say like colonial like setting and perspective in which I didn't even know that like a non-binary um, um, existence for me would be possible because I thought either I'm a trans woman or I'm a gay man. Yeah. I was like, okay, I know that I'm not a trans woman because of the specific relationship that I have to my body. Mm -hmm. So um, back within the definitions of these older years. Um, and now that this developed, um, I often find myself being in between because um, I've, I mean, of course, my, my since non-binary is also under the trans umbrella and I didn't understand that at first, but now I understand why. Mm. Because there is these distortions because this body that I was born into is not specifically like, like the body, like how I feel inside. Um, so that is one part of my perspective. But then also um, I was socialized within the vehicle of being a cis gay man. So there is a, there is a closeness to that also. Yeah. And that for me personally, within my own experience, always brings up the topic, so who am I? Mm -hmm. Because the experiences that I made back then in my early 20s, for example, they were real. Like I wouldn't say like this, you know, this thing like I'm ripping off the mask right now. Uh, there are aspects of that, but it's not only that. So, um, and I think this is maybe the point where we could connect because we have similar experiences, but then then after my, my gender shift, um, I could kind of see it from the inside, but also from the outside. Mm. And I think maybe that brought another layer of, um, of reflection towards the story that we talked about in the beginning when it was about like carving things out or things becoming three-dimensional. Yeah. And in that way, it was also a really interesting project for me because it was me looking back onto, I don't say like my old self, because Moritz is not autobiographical for me, but looking at my, the old topics and mm. situations um, and themes um, which I was exposed to back then. And now it's, of course, it's completely different. We also talked about that, like for example, I went to the party Cocktail d'Amore with a close um, gay friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And afterwards he said, it was so terrible, like I feel so bad and I didn't feel well at this party at all. And I was there with two non-binary trans friends and we had the best time ever. Like we were dancing like right in front of the DJ the entire time. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, why is this difference so big? And there were times back then when I also didn't feel well at Cocktail d'Amore at all. And then I figured, oh wow, it's because I run on a different filter at the same party now. Yeah. I'm not exposed to the comparison because um, I wear like nail polish and maybe lipstick and this is why, why many gay men don't give a fuck about me anymore at all. And I'm like, okay, whatever. It's like you can't take these things off or what. <laughs> but um, yeah, for me, it felt really relieving. Mm -hmm. And then, I just, and then uh, talking to my friend, I figured how big the pressure actually is and he, you know mm. like he was wearing like a t-shirt and, and jeans you know it's not like he was jumping around in a jock strap and then like the physis was compared it's just yeah i think the under this um uh, under this image of the free and queer berlin there is still in the structures also in the dark rooms on the dance floors there is so many hidden very very conservative structures, I think mm. that we need to slowly dig out and, um, and to heal. Yeah. Yeah. And I think not by judging, but by applying care, even though it can be a little bit exhausting sometimes for the more 
um, from individuals in the surroundings. But right. I mean, we, ha we have to do the work, like what can we do? We have to heal mm. together. Mm. I see. Uh, this brings me also to Lorenz. Um, I mean, you also mentioned it yourself that Moritz is not like really a talkative character. Um, and obviously now we are talking about this um, physicality of, of the film. And obviously it's a very physical role. Mm -hmm. um, a lot is being told through your body. You have to put words mm -hmm. on a minimum and, and expression comes through other means. Um, can you tell us a, a bit about, about this and how did you approach the physicality of this role? Um, yes, uh, Hannes and I, we that's <laughs> <laughs> I went forced to him to do uh, some push <laughs> and stuff. No, uh -huh. not a, a lot of, uh, because mm -hmm. there's this transformation in the mm -hmm. middle of yeah. Moritz where he has to get really masculine and a lot of muscles and um, I'm actually not really into sports. <laughs> I think it's super Welcome boring. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went to, uh, how's it, CrossFit? Yeah, <laughs> I sent you to CrossFit. <laughs> and actually it was a good um, research also at the same time mm. because it's like, yeah, um, doing sport with your own weight outside and a lot of, yeah, really masculine men around you and um, so this was one part I um, I never did so much sport yeah. afterwards <laughs> um, that helped mm -hmm. um, to to play this middle part. And well, I think also because if you go to CrossFit three times, it's not about that your body changes. It's also about like how you see yourself and sure. you see all these people around, and this makes a lot uh, also for for the. Mm. That you learn how to how to play the the second modes. Yeah, yeah. And then it's about also exposing yourself, uh, your skin, of course. Um, your hair, like all your body parts, and yeah. also to. Yeah, but that worked really well because I think um, we were talking about this um, before we were shooting, um, that we want to show authentic <laughs> bodies or yeah. people how they are, and um, this is also one thing about movies I really don't like that um, everything looks so perfect the whole time and I think there are some like young royals I don't know if you have seen it like where teenagers the first episode <laughs> like yeah <laughs> but but I, I like that they basically uh, that you can see pimples that you can mm. see that they are um, no. Yeah, just yeah so it was really a decision to also show like the imperfections of skin, yeah. for example. And, and we even added some, some things, stuff. Like, <laughs> like sometimes when there was, for example, the walk outside with Noah in the, in mm -hmm. the winter, we really, uh, Eli Bernicke, the camera, yeah. DOP, um, she really wanted to focus on this and we brought some red highlights in the skin mm. tone. So. But also mm -hmm. like I, for example, I have like scarves on my back and when you saw it, you were like, oh, <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> it can, yeah. I mean, is it okay for you? Because you see them like, f like really, I mean, you right. see them. Yeah. And um, yeah. I mean, I think we then also, like when I have a grinder date, mm -hmm. the guy is asking me, what is it? And I like yeah. say something about it, but. Um, yeah, this is also like how, how we work together, that like some of the things like Lorenz scars on his back, that we just use them in the scene. Or, yeah. or the clarinet. I, yeah, exactly. This is what I wanted to say. I was asking you like, hey, we need something that you do in the beginning of the film. I was still writing on the screenplay and I read your bio uh, from his agency and it says that you know how to play the clarinet. And I was like, okay, then let's use it and you're mm -hmm. going to play the clarinet in the beginning. So. Yeah. And it's, I think it's a, like the perfect instrument for Moritz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very like, well, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, let's then turn to towards the, the maybe this third world um, that Moritz enters uh, towards the end of the film with the help of, of Kazi and with the help of Eleftheria. So there is a more feminine energy coming into the picture after all this hyper masculine exposure um, can you tell us a bit can, can you elaborate a bit on on how did 
this come into it and how did you woven this into into the storyline and of course it's obviously for more it's 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 a bit of an exploration of of another side of yeah. of himself as well i mean i can say something yeah maybe this time you and then i can say something yeah, yeah. But I mean, this is the, a possibility of how Moritz um, can continue his journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Kazi was always the idea that um, Kazi is like a parent um, to, mm -hmm. to Moritz at one point and also likes this position of taking care and, and guiding maybe young gay guys mm -hmm. into a possible path for themselves. and. Um, yeah, and it's a celebration also of his body in the end, that um, um, of, of of Moritz's body and of the body <coughs> of everybody else and the colorfulness, and um, then also the camera changes a little bit in the style. Mm -hmm. yeah. The last images are a bit more pink um, um, in the highlights in the sky, um, but then in the very last uh, scene where he sits in the car. Yeah. Um, it's actually taken from a scene much earlier in the screen play that we just moved in the editing process towards the end. It's just the old cis gay Moritz guy with his shaved hair again and his tank top. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think essentially it's about, uh, I think, vulnerability and care. And I think. Um, Moritz is developing very, very fast within the film, but also a lot on the outside. Mm. It's a lot about the style and then, but also about the surroundings. So about uh, different path in life that you can choose or different models of life that you can live. Um, also this classical model of the rainbow family, which is nothing for Moritz yet and so on. And I think at some point, Moritz as a character reaches a point where he cannot explore or develop further without facing his insights and without, as you said, becoming um, tender towards himself and opening up. And I think um, this is the point where the more femme-oriented um, characters start playing a role in, in preventing a space for Moritz in which mm. Moritz can open up and also like really literally like showing showing Moritz techniques of being like, hey, this is how you can be tender to yourself. You can take a foot bath. Mm -hmm. This thing exists. Mm -hmm. um, it's against your pain. Um, and I think, yeah, that was necessary for the process of Moritz. And I think it's very interesting that simultaneously um, friendships start playing a bigger role in Moritz's life and also something that could be considered something like a collective way of living or mm -hmm. so later on. And this didn't play such a big role at first. It was more like right. this companionship and then maybe sometimes also <laughs> a little bit fucking. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and then towards the end, it's more like something where like, okay, this could actually, like this starts to become profound relationships and um, emotional, emotional bonds and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and we were talking a, m a lot about how passive this character is, um, but actually, in the very end, in the last scenes, Moritz is be is finding himself and he's becoming active because he's inviting Eleftheria over to Kazi, mm -hmm. Eleftheria and her girlfriend. He's then bringing all them together to his birthday party, yeah. so he's actually bringing the people together, and he's with friends at the end. Mm -hmm. So it shows a little bit. Okay, maybe he has found him. He has found himself, and now he can take action, which in the beginning he couldn't. Yeah, absolutely. I have one last question to Lo, and um, I'm always curious about this, and sometimes actors talk about it, what they take away from. From, from a particular role or what they learned from mm. that character. <laughs> Is there anything like that that you, <laughs> that, you are, that you are taking on for, for the future from Moritz? Yes, Morris? totally. Um, I, I, <laughs> I have to say, um, it, it, I mean, Hannes also showed me basically a world that I didn't know like this before. <laughs> I, I, I think I can say this. I mean, yeah, of course. Um, 
just to frame it, I mean, I, I've been raised in Hamburg and my parents are really open-minded and everything, but um, this 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 scene or the, this queer scene in Berlin, I, I haven't, um, I haven't, I, I didn't know it like yeah, this before. I didn't and, know about it. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, in the beginning, for example, with all, with everyone, like from the from the cast, we went to Herrensauna for one night, and I mean, you haven't been to Herrensauna before. Oscar Hoppe hasn't been to Herrensauna before, um, and we were just experiencing all the things that mm. you can do <laughs> <laughs> um, as a re research. And what's really funny is also that. I played a lot of different scenarios yeah. and then I, I mean, not like in the movie, but then I experienced them. Mm. So that yeah. was one thing um, uh, that was really funny because um, I thought, ah, oh, I know the situation, but I, I have played it and now I've, I've seen it in reality, so it has to be true. <laughs> but yeah, so I definitely yeah take a lot from this role and um, from this project also because yeah. um there was such an yeah, how should i describe it um positive energy on the set yeah. like everybody was so into it and put everything they have in this project and i think that's why it's so yeah. special yeah i think it was it started as a, like we made yeah. this little project i didn't know how big it turns out in the end also, we started shooting with like in the middle part with Noah in the winter yeah. um, to try out if like kind of the whole situation, everything is like working more or less. And then only we really started working more intensely also on the screenplay, River and me together. And uh, all the actors from like Gustav, um, for example, who plays Jonas, we just uh, found him afterwards because mm -hmm. we, we started with the middle part where he's not in. Yeah. And then ma more and more people came together, Joost Hering, a film joined, um, Salzgeber joined the project and at the end it became like a metaphysical party, I could say, <laughs> it's like the whole shoot, also during Covid times. Yeah, what you mentioned um, before, that everybody wanted to show their yeah. stories, to show the, the, the scene and that... And it, like now yeah. many people work together from this film, they have found uh, jobs, they're working on other projects, so... Mm. Many friendships also mm. have started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Well, so, yeah. thank you so much. We hope uh, for a good premiere. Yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I wish you all the best for the premiere, obviously. And um, yeah, then we see each other on the twenty fourth of February at the Teddy Award. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.